Hi everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. For today's video, I'm going to do something I haven't done before. I'm going to open up viewer mail, and I'm going to call it Mail Call. Okay, totally unoriginal name, but I didn't know what else to call it, so we're doing Mail Call number one. Let's get right to it. All right, let's start this off. So the first thing I got was something for my very sad ZX Spectrum. If you remember this computer, I haven't shown it in a while. I picked this up while in England and this top cover was really scratched up. And when I peeled it off to try to fix the keyboard membrane, which is right here, it got a little bit bent up and rather ugly. So Peter from ZX Renew reached out and graciously offered to send me some replacement parts for my good old Spectrum. He enclosed his business card and I will put a link to his website and Twitter in the description below. So please check that out. So the box says dust cover, but when we take this out, here's the actual dust cover this is for the spectrum. So if I grab the spectrum, that's great. That that'll keep that thing nice and clean. Once I do fix it up, he sent a new keyboard topper. So this is the metal plate that got all messed up on mine and here is a brand spanking new one. Compared to the original one, which is top, it's a very good reproduction. And I think, oh look, it already has included adhesive on the bottom, which pretty much matches exactly where the original adhesive was. Although actually the original one had no adhesive along the top, but it had the sides and the bottom. I might be scared to put all of this down and I might just peel off the sides here because this was so difficult to take off. And if I ever have to do it again, I want to avoid all the bending I did on this one. Now let's just take the actual spectrum and place this over the keyboard. And look at that. It makes it look absolutely fantastic. That's wonderful. All right, next Peter sent me also a new keyboard membrane. Now my old one was working fine. Here's the old one here. It's a little different looking and it's a bit thicker. But the old one was delaminating on the connectors here. So while I did get it working again by cutting this off, I think this one in particular, I had to trim it down and then move this little plastic piece. The new one is full length. If I flip this the correct way, you can see how much longer these strips are here. This was the original one on the top, which I've had to cut down. Anyhow, that will allow me to get the keyboard working perfectly once again. So a huge thank you to Peter for sending me these parts. I can't wait till my Specky looks absolutely brand new again. I will be featuring this in an upcoming video. Next up, we have this wonderful assortment of Commodore parts here that Sven sent me. He took pity upon me when I did my Commodore 64 repair-a-thon and I didn't have the Commodore 64 test harness. If I move these boards out of the way, what you see left here are the main components of the Commodore 64 test harness. Starting on the left, we have what goes on the keyboard connector inside the machine. And I do have to install a passive on there. So you plug this in. This middle board here is for the cassette port interface. And this allows it to do some testing there. There will be a ribbon cable that goes to this board, which is the PCB and user port connection, which sort of facilitates the primary testing of everything. There's a couple ICs that go on there. We have three ribbon cables that go to different things. And there is also what I don't show here is an IEC loopback port. When you combine all of this together and everything's all hooked up, when you run one of the Commodore 64 test ROMs, then it can successfully test all of the various IO ports, including the joystick ports, which are what these are for, and the cassette and the IEC. And you don't get any of those failure messages inside the diagnostic screen. I'll be showing that in operation once I finish assembling this. In addition, Sven sent me this PCB here, which is obviously a Commodore 64 ROM cartridge with all sorts of configurability, which is fantastic. I have one of these already, which I got, I think from eBay, but it's nice to have a second one because now I can build up another ROM that has other functionality on it. And he sent me these PCBs, which he designed after he watched my Commodore 64 Arduino kernel switching videos. I think one of these actually takes an AT Mega or an AT Tiny and allows the switching to happen right on the board. So I don't need a little external thing, but I actually honestly haven't really looked into this, but I will in a future video. I really appreciate it, Sven. Thank you very much for sending all this. 
I will put Sven's Twitter handle down in the description below, so feel free to reach out to him if you're interested about any of his designs. All right, and finally we have this rather large package from Marcos. Marcos reached out to me a few weeks ago asking if I would like to get one of his old computers, something he recently found that he has had since he was young, that his parents bought him. And his wife was asking him to clean up the garage and he didn't want to see this go into the e-waste. So he asked if I would like it. I said absolutely and he sent it my way all the way from the East Coast. So thank you Marcos. I haven't even opened this up yet. So I hope that it has survived shipping. It's a pretty heavy package. Let's open this up and take a look at what this is. Alright, I think there's a bit of a seam right here. We got packing peanuts <laughs> and they're already coming out. All right, there we go. Oh no, definitely have a little bit of damage. Well, you can tell what kind of computer this is and uh, it's kind of unfortunate that we have a little bit of breakage. Here's the main computer right here. C128D. So yeah, the keyboard has definitely seen better days. It actually completely smashed the key switch off there. And look at this three key. It's really mangled. Looks like the case got a little bit broken there too. There's a bit of a crack there. I can try to repair that maybe. Let me dig around inside this box to see if I can find those extra keys. Hopefully some of them are not broken. So there's the keyboard. Uh, these two keys, the 9 and the plus, are fine. These three keys did not survive. 6 has a broken stem, and then the minus or dash, and the 3 are just completely blown out. And then we, I found one plunger, broken plunger, and then this piece, unfortunately, is from the keyboard here. And you can see on the keyboard, unfortunately, when the plunger ripped out, it actually broke this part here. I I think that these are probably changeable and I can take them off my other keyboard. So this one is broken, this one is broken, and obviously this one is broken. And then I have plungers I can take off my other keyboard. And if you can believe it, I found all five of the springs in the box. They, they are there. They're just coiled up together. And if you see right here, there's a little bit of damage on the case there. Somehow that, that part got pushed in. But I think I can pop that back and a little bit of epoxy on the back should make that mostly invisible. It almost looks like there's just a hair sitting there, but that's actually the plastic that's got a crack. Otherwise, things are looking okay with that keyboard. So here's my Sparrow 128 keyboard, and for the most part, I have most of the keys, although unfortunately, I am missing the three key, and that's one of the ones that's blown out here. Although, you know what? I can probably glue this because the stem on this one is actually not broken. The plunger broke off first, so if I can just sort of push this plastic back together. Oh yeah, it does, it goes back together, and then glue it. Then I suppose I can get a working three, and combine with the nine and the plus, which are already good on that keyboard, all that's missing is the six key, and I have a functional good six key on this keyboard. I'll just have to retrobrite it. This whole keyboard needs a little bit of retrobrite. And then obviously I have lots of plungers, and I have uh, these little things, If if I'm not even sure if these are removable. If they are, then I can transfer them to that. Otherwise, I can take this entire base plate that's on this keyboard and put it in here. Well, let's move the keyboard out of the way and take a look at the computer. Ah, oh, this thing is very heavy. Seems to have survived. There's maybe a little bit of a dent right there. Maybe that's where the keyboard was slamming into it, but no cracks that I immediately see. Also, yep, the corner here is a bit caved in. Like maybe it took a tumble or something and landed right on that. Although the box didn't have any punctures, so that might have been there before, who knows, right? This is a metal case, so it's pretty durable and strong. Yep, sides look good. And on the back, things look okay. I mean, power switch seems like it's a little re more recessed than I would imagine it should be. Everything looks fine though. I don't see any kind of dents or anything strange on the back. And on this side, oh, we got a errant packing peanut popping out the side. But yeah, it seems okay. There's a little bit of the paint chipped off right there where whatever this impact was, the plastic probably scratched that off. And there's a little bit of white there probably from impact, but seems all right. 
Let me give it a quick clean down and then remove the lid. All right, a little cleaning and this thing looks pretty nice on the outside. Let's crack this open and take a look at inside. I don't hear any loose parts inside when I flip it upside down, so that's a really good sign. Sorry for the noise, my furnace is running once again. It's a cold evening here in Portland. All right, there we go, slides off and lifts up. There we are, we're in like Flynn. Whoa, it's really clean in here. Let's just use the compressed air. Clean out any of this, uh, of the, of the little peanut, packing peanut dust that might be in here. So I thought maybe the power switch shouldn't be as recessed as this, but this looks absolutely fine. Like I don't think anything got bent. In fact, the way the power supply is mounted to the rear chassis, you see there's a little bit of a lip there, so there should be space. So I guess this is, that's just how it is. Interesting is there's provision for a fan, but there is definitely no fan installed, at least in this computer, which is probably how this stayed so clean and fresh inside after all these years. So I don't know a whole lot about Commodore 128s, but from my understanding, there are a couple different versions and there's the earlier non-cost reduced ones that I guess had a plastic case. This is actually a Commodore 128 DCR for cost reduced. The motherboard layout on this seems totally different than my flat units. And I was under the impression that the original 128s, the motherboard in the flats was the same or basically the same as the ones that were in the non-cost reduced ones. But this one, for instance, has the floppy drive controller for the 1571 right on the motherboard. But let me give this thing a little bit of a once over before I attempt to power it up. This cap is sort of shifted out of position a little bit. So I don't think Marcos was able to power this thing up and test it before he sent it to me. So we don't know if this thing works and we will find out together. Electrolytics, they all look fine. No damage there. Filter caps, it's using polymer ones as opposed to reefas. So no reefa that I have to complain about. Power. Yeah, this all looks pretty damn good. So you're not really gonna be able to see this on camera, but strangely, the video connector here for the RGB is sort of on at a weird angle. And uh, it doesn't protrude from the back of the case, not to mention the back of the case doesn't seem to have suffered any kind of impacts. So I don't know why that's on at an angle like that. It's time to test this out. Let's plug it into a monitor and plug it into power and see what happens. We're gonna do it with the lid off in case any smoke comes out. All right, first let's plug in the video cable. Make sure the power supply switch is off. All right, the mains is connected. I'm gonna leave the keyboard off. I think the monitor is on the right input. Here we go. All right, we have a picture. Floppy drive is trying to boot. Of course, the picture doesn't look so great. That well could be a problem with my connections on the back of the monitor here. Let's take a look. I always mess up the way the Luma and Chrome are connected on the Commodore monitor. There we go, people. There we are, look at that! That is really sharp and nice. Let's turn it off and on again. Off, on. Looking good. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I gotta say that actually probably looks a little bit sharper than even my C128 flats that I have. And let's reset again and take a look at this, the seek on the floppy drive. That's normal, that's what it should do. And let's try hooking up the bruised and battered keyboard. All right, even though we're missing those keys, let's turn this on. Go 64. Oh dear. Okay, so you got a lot of threes showing up on screen. And the reason for the threes is inside this key here, it left the little rubber contact pad laying on top of the PCB. Actually, it did it also for these other keys here. So. I'm just going to pull those out with some tweezers. Just a little tweezer action and I was able to yank these right out. Should work better now. Go, 64. Are you sure? I am indeed. There we are. Alright, let's see if we can get Ultima 6 to load. So far so good. Ah, yes, it's working. Oh, this 128D, thank you, Marcos. This thing gave you many years of enjoyment, hopefully, when you were young. 
And now I am going to really love this. I Sorry, I'm just listening to the music. I... It's amazing they got Ultima 6 to even work on the Commodore 64. And I know they took features out versus like the PC VGA version. It's still amazing though. And yes, you're not seeing a picture, but that's because the game is still loading currently as the music plays, so that's cool. A little bit of multitasking. Yeah, there we go. Origin Presents, a Lord British production, 1990. So there it is. Incidentally, this monitor didn't used to have sound or the power LED. There was a burned out resistor that I was able to tra track down and replace, and that fixed both. So I'm really happy about that because I used to accidentally leave this monitor on for long periods because I couldn't see if it was on or not. Anyways. Well, that's going to be it for this video. If you have anything you'd be interested in donating to the channel, you can reach out to me at the email address you'll find on my channel about page. Hit me up there and we can chat about it. And a huge thank you to Marcos for sending me this Commodore 128. Even if the keyboard took a little bit of a beating, I hope I can get this fixed up. A huge thank you to Sven for sending me those PCBs so I can finally have a proper Commodore 64 diagnostic test harness. That way I'm not testing things and just guessing that they work. I'll actually know that all the I.O. ports are working. And then a huge thank you to Peter for sending me those ZX Spectrum parts to get my specky looking fantastic. Check out his store at ZX Renew. I'll put a link to his store in the description box, so don't forget to check it out. Thank you very much for watching. Thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. Thumbs down if you didn't. You can leave comments and questions down in the comment section below. And if you haven't already, subscribe for more videos. And hit that little bell if you want to be notified when I upload new ones. And that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. How cool and it works!